From performing stand-up to co-hosting the hit talk show, The View, Chicago native Sherry Shepard has been entertaining and connecting with audiences across the country with her sense of humor and openness. More than a comedian, Sherry is also an actress, author, mother, friend, and activist. Sherry Shepard, on this episode of Leading Women. Sherry Shepard is bright, and wherever there's darkness, she brings in the light. Sherry Shepard, to me, is pure love. Sherry is totally lovable. I thought she was a big old baby. Just a big old playful baby. You just want to say, come here. Like Pebbles. She's like Pebbles Flintstone to me. I really didn't know that I had a gift for making people laugh. It's just what I would always, in painful moments or times, I always turn to laughter. I like being in front of people. If I could see a smile on their face, I love that. So I either thought I was gonna do that, I thought I was gonna marry Michael Jackson, which I think every girl did. But I never thought about like Michael Jackson and I sleeping together. We would just have matching jumpsuits. I was a legal secretary at a law firm in Beverly Hills. And the secretaries one day, I just was like, let's go out. I said, let's go to a comedy club. Let's go to the comedy store. And then Eddie Griffin went up and Eddie Griffin got on that stage and I just saw people moving forward and backwards, like a wave, all together, forward and backwards at stuff that they could relate to. And I thought, I want to do that. And my one girlfriend, Donetta, said to me, she said, Sherry, if you never try it, you're never going to know. So I think that you should go for it. And she actually loaned me money to take a comedy class with Judy Carter. I was still a legal secretary when I was doing stand-up. It was really hard, but I just got this bug. I love going to the comedy clubs. I was meeting new comics. That's when I met Jamie Foxx, I met Chris Tucker, TK Kirkland, Cheryl Underwood, D.L. Hughley. It was just like this whole world of comics. But it was really hard because, you know, I had to be at work at, at uh, nine in the morning. Sometimes I would, get my outfits confused because I would have on wigs with the thigh high pretty because pretty woman was out I was going through this pretty woman phase these thigh high boots and my wig and something with a lot of cleavage because back then my boobs set up they was beautiful set up right underneath my chin by the time she paid for voice lessons uh, these pictures that she had to have her rent her car note or the lack thereof of her car note she had no money left you know, from being a Jehovah's Witness, I, I thought, you know, we were taught that Armageddon was going to come. And I really thought that Armageddon was going to come, so I didn't pay none of my bills. Because I was like, Armageddon going to come, what, why I got to pay my bills? So I had really bad credit, and they repossessed my car three times. Armageddon still ain't came. She got her car repossessed. She said, you know, uh, the bus is right here, and I'm going to save a whole lot more money, you know, getting on the bus. I would always just walk to the bus stop. And I remember I was sitting out there at the bus stop and I was so scared because it was so late. And uh, you could see men standing in the in the doorways. When you're you're funny and you're good looking and let alone have a big old tatas, I mean it's just not easy because people think that you're you're not capable. Doing the clubs, it was very hard for a woman. People don't like even now. The clubs don't like putting women up. Women, you better come with something. If you don't have a role manager, if your male comics that are with you, not there to fight for you, which usually they're not, um, you don't get paid. Cheryl Underwood, I went with her one time on the road, and they told us that they didn't have our money, and Cheryl told them she had a gun in the car. Now granted, we flew there. It ain't even no car, but Cheryl was like, I can't even say the words on TV, but it was a bleep, 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 mother bleep, bleep, bleep. If you don't get my the bleep, bleep, mother bleep, bleep money, I'm gonna take my bleep, bleep gun and shoot the bleep, bleep up. We had our money after Cheryl with the bleep bleeps, that big dude gave us our money. And I looked at Cheryl and I was like, I can't do what you do. And she's like, girl, it's easy. You just do it. You just tell. I, and I couldn't. I tried that one time and it was like, be please. You ain't gonna, what you gonna do? Like, and I was like, please don't come on stage. I was just playing. I'm, I'm not gonna mess you up. I can't even say the curse word right. So I started doing characters. I remember I was with Hope Flood and Joe Torrey and there was a, a gig all the way down in, oh my gosh, like Victorville. This was a club where you go, like all the people from America's Most Wanted, they was always at this club. It was like you would look at these people going, I know they didn't kill somebody, but we gotta make them laugh. You had to fight for your stage time. And I think 
in stand-up comedy, I guess it's why I got such a thick skin with acting, because in stand-up comedy, the strong survive. And if you stay long enough, you will do it. Every time I've seen Sherry on stage, she's killed. Extremely funny. Sherry Shepard had a gift of being able to work all comedy clubs. Every comic cannot do it. She could go up in a Jewish synagogue and kill. She can go anywhere and do well. She's just a person. She's just a person with real stories that she's not afraid to tell. I just tried to do as many rooms as would give me stage time. And that's what made me happy when I got on stage. Because at the same time, my mother was had diabetes. And she was always in the hospital. She was in and out of the hospital. And so comedy for me was a way to escape. What happened was I was doing stand-up, and I started seeing that a lot of the comics that I was coming up with were getting into acting. So I just was like, well, let me just take some acting classes since I'm not doing anything. We met in an acting class, and uh, Kim Fields was the coach, and Sherry didn't have a car. So clearly, before she was on The View. I started going, I want to do that. I don't want to be a legal secretary anymore. This is not, I started realizing this is what I want to do, and I wanted to quit and I just wanted to pursue the acting full time, but I was really scared. But a friend of mine had said to me, he said, if it was all about stability, you wouldn't need faith. You gotta jump at, at some point, you know? Um, and I, I gave my notice, I believe March 1st, and then I had an audition for the show called Cleghorn, and uh, I booked the gig, and it was a series regular. That's after I quit my job, 12 days after I had quit my job. Sherry would book a show but they didn't last. Sherry would get a pilot, she'd get a series, and they would get canceled. So Sherry would pick up her little law keys and off to work again. I'm like, Sherry, what's going on? Said, Girl, I gotta go back to the law firm. It was amazing. When Sherry would come back to work and it was canceled, she would come back and she'd be very positive. She'd say something like, that's their loss. They're gonna be very, very sorry that they didn't keep that show on. Cause it ain't nothing like getting on the bus and somebody go, was you on that show? Um, Clay, what you doing on the bus? You know, and I would get a lot of that. She was a working actress, literally. Like she would work on a pilot, work on a TV show and work at the law firm. I got evicted. So my girlfriend let me stay on her couch in the jungle over there off Crenshaw and um, I had to go back to working as a legal secretary. And so I would sit at my desk, show canceled, laying on my girlfriend's couch who also, she was struggling comic, so she was a phone sex operator and a psychic hotline uh, at the same time. She had one phone line. I'm laying on the couch sleep. Freaking Ralph would call at three in the morning. Somebody, is Georgia there? No, ain't nobody here in Oh, yeah, hold on. Get the phone. Then I hear her breathing hard in the room for Ralph and then talking about, you know, you sucking my foot, Ralph? You suck my toe, suck my toe. No sleep. I, it was just depressing. And uh, I got really humbled and I, I realized, you know what, you gotta take care of your money. You share, you gotta get out of debt. And uh, like my dad taught me, in the stillness, when nothing is going on, do something. So I started paying my bills and trying to get out of debt because I was tired of living on people's couches. And then other stuff started happening. I had done a guest on Suddenly Susan. Brooke Shields liked me, and then they called me back for um, a series regular, and I got that. So I was doing that at the time, and Everybody Loves Raymond called. Everybody Loves Raymond was just really special. I was working with these actors who were so down to earth. What happened here? Well, we got a temp dirty. Better check uh, outside. You got a Yeah. No getaway car. Got no friends. <laughs> It's all right, we'll give him a ride. Get him out of here. I'll radio it in. I've been on shows where it's just been awful and shows where it's been wonderful. And I saw that it starts with the stars of the show. I started realizing that she's gonna be great with Jamie Foxx. If you ask me, Sherry, what was the most fun you had? It was playing Sheila on the Jamie Foxx show. I was the black girl on all the white shows. So to be on the show, it was just like, black people! Black people! It was nice. 
and Jamie. I love making Jamie laugh. If you could make Jamie laugh, you know, while he was doing his lines, it just was a good day. There was one point in time where Sherry was the go-to black girl for every white sitcom in the world. You could turn on any white sitcom, predominantly white cast, boom. There my friend was gonna be sitting there in the mix. Less Than Perfect was so wonderful, but I remember Less Than Perfect because of Andy Dick, because we got so close and he made it so special for me to be there. On the set of um, Less Than Perfect, uh, during the course of the, the run of that show, I, I, was, I was drinking, I was having trouble. And she was a source of inspiration and support. The first movie that I did, probably was like a little part on a movie called Cellular. And it was just, I auditioned for this little part, and it was great, and I did it, and it was wonderful. And then the second movie came in, it was a movie called Beauty Shop. And it was so much fun working with Queen Latifah and working with Golden Brooks and Alfre Woodard. That was my first big movie. What makes me so proud to see in movies and on The View is that she's getting to be around all these people that, as an average person, you think you never not be around. You know, I'm so sorry to, to sit here next to you oh and Whoopi God. Goldberg and you guys oh, no, I don't know. No. <laughs> been trying for three years to get on The View just to publicize my show, Less Than Perfect. I didn't want to be a co-host. I just wanted to get on there and say, watch my show on ABC. She just kept filling in, and she had new stuff each time. And she was funny, and funny in a different way every time. So we realized, oh, well, she could stand the test of time. When we had an opportunity to hire a permanent person, we said, you know, who do we love? Who's wonderful? Who's funny? Who's charming? Who is relatable? And the answer was Sherry Shepard. Well, this is the worst kept secret <laughs> of the oh month, God. but we would like you now to welcome our new permanent co-host, Sherry Shepard. <laughs> she can just sense a mood, and she is like a prescription where if there's a tense moment, she brings up something that really happened in her life, somehow, and turns it into something hysterical. I was really, really, really nervous because I think it was my second or third day on the show, and so they wanted to talk about evolution. And um, I think I have adult ADD because I zone out sometimes. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting there with all of these women, and I was trying to figure out how a check had bounced, and I wasn't quite paying attention to what was going on. And I heard, Earth round and flat. Then I'm trying to figure out, did I buy stuff for Jeffrey because he needed lunch for preschool? The earth rounded flat. And I saw Barbara ask me something, and I said, I don't know. That's what really happened. I don't know. And she says, well, what are you going to tell? What are you going to tell your son? And I was like, I'll take him to the library. I'm just trying to figure out how to feed my baby. When Sherry said the earth was flat, I hollered. Because, see, that's why she got the job, and I did because I would have said something worse than that. I'm not going to tell you what I'd have said. Because what happens is sometimes, as comics and artists, you might be thinking about that chicken you laid out or the oven you left on. I know where she was. I saw it. She was listening. They were talking. And she was like, oh, what the, did I turn off the oven? I'm telling you, because I've been, I'm no sure. I didn't know that the magnitude of this show. Now I'm all panicked. I'm getting emails from everybody on my website. My website crashed. I got an email from one lady talking about, I wouldn't want you to be in third grade with my nephew. And I was like, well, I don't want to be in third grade with your nephew either, sin. I mean, I'm answering it, I'm just, you know, and I'm just like, John, oh my gosh, well, everybody, they hate me. They hate me. Black people hate me, because I'm misrepresenting black people. Why does she have to be the representative for black people? Really? We'll be sitting right there, let her take it. You be the representative for big-breasted women with small hips. 
That's what shit where it should be. You're gonna say something some days where, you know, it's gonna take people off. I don't have any experience in that area particularly. Um, but I told her, I said, if you just aim, you know, I know she's a woman of incredible faith. And I said, look, you aim to please an audience of one. She was nervous. And so somebody would say to her, you know, isn't the world round, Sherry? And she'd say, I don't know. Like really scared. She, of course she knows the world is round and we bought her a globe. So now she really knows. <laughs> I went on Jay Leno with the globe and I said, hey, I'm not the black Jessica Simpson. You know, it, nobody cares about that. It will always be Sherry. I guess it's just, you know, who doesn't know if the earth is round or flat. Sherry talks about her life in, in a very, um, you know, kind of an every woman way. She she really is like re highly relatable. She is also by her own admission, she's educated herself. I, this is a kind of program where you do have to, um, you know, be exposed to a great many things and read a lot of newspapers and so forth. And she's been wonderful. And I think it's been a very good experience for her and a very good experience for us. I'm that girl, I don't have the college degree. I don't know a lot about politics, but I'm willing to learn. And I'm willing to sit at the table and go, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm willing to sit there and go, okay, I'm getting bored with this. Can we talk about Dance with the Stars? We put her in a position where we already had a black woman moderating. So so there was some question like, well, you got you got your black. We were going, yeah, but, but there's diversity in this world outside of skin color. Maybe we'd be the first show to show that there's diversity amongst black people. You know, that, that was, that was the, I don't think anybody had ever done it before. And certainly I don't remember any other talk show, the mainstream talk show network talk show that had hired two black women. It's very nice that on this uh, television show that goes on every day live, has two sisters on the panel. So she's also like a comfort. Cause I can look over and go, do you know what I'm talking about? Cause sometimes, you know, you say something and it's like, huh? And then I look at Sherry and she'll look at me and we'll go, yeah, okay, we know what it is. You know, we're a family and the chemistry of this program is what is the most important. I think she recognizes that she's so much powerful um, in that platform and, and she's finding the best of both worlds. You know, being on The View, being able to go do 30 Rock, being able to, to work on a pilot for a lifetime. She's learning the ropes here. She's getting ready to learn the ropes of being the star of her own show and that responsibility. I think it's gonna be called Sherry. And uh, this is a pilot. It's a story that I pitched a few years back. Um, wow, talking about turning lemons into lemonade. I went through uh, I went through a period with my husband. It was, uh, he had an affair and uh, the girl got pregnant and we were going through a divorce or go are going through a divorce and, you know, dealing with interracial stuff. The woman was white who had the baby. You know, that's a whole nother thing. You know, I'm a black woman. You, man didn't cheat on me with a white woman. Oh my gosh. That's a whole nother thing you got to process. So I started getting on stage and I just started talking about what I was going through. A year and a half later, I get a call from the vice president of Lifetime Networks and she says, I read your script and your script embodies what we feel Lifetime is about. How women rallied around you, gave you strength through this painful time. We want to shoot a pilot and I'm hoping that this pilot and it's, will, will show people that you can forgive and you can get up and you can put a smile on your face and, and you know count on your girlfriends to get you through and it's always you know, every day that God wakes you up is a good day. I grew up in, on the south side of Chicago. My, uh, my entire family lived on the south side, so uh, growing up was just a lot of fun. Sherry being the oldest, like I said, I learned a lot by raising her, so my next two girls were able to get what Sherry taught me. My parents were very uh, religious. They were Christians, and then later on, they became Jehovah's Witnesses, so they always were very strict with us. Probably which is why I got into so much trouble, because they were so strict. My dad loved to laugh, he loved to have fun, but he let you know he was your daddy. I came from the project, then went home to 29th Street, 
And raising my child, I'm raising them from the things I learned, how I was, okay? I knew I wasn't going to college, but it was best for my child to go as far as she could go. My dad, you know, he wanted his girls to be, like I said, high achievers. He wanted us to be very independent and to um, be proud. We moved to the suburbs and to uh, the northwest suburbs, Hoffman Estates, Illinois. So I went to high school at Hoffman Estates High School. It probably was maybe three or four black people, my sister, myself. Uh, another girl and I think the janitor. When I moved into Hoffman Estate, I wanted them to see you could be around another ethnic group and you can be what you want to be. I heard the N-word more times than I cared to repeat. And people were just, they didn't know what to make of us, my sister and I. Now my sister dealt with it, my sister Lisa, she would get mad at people, she fought a lot. Me, I tried to make people like me by making them laugh. Cause I figured if I make you laugh, then maybe you're gonna forget to call me. Um, the N-word. So that's what I always try to do, to, to get rid of that pain. There was times when I needed her, you know, I would be in a fight and I'd run, you know, Sherry, she was there, you know, and vice versa. So it, it was, it was adventurous, <laughs> definitely. My parents got divorced, so, so my mom um, wanted to get as far away as she could from Chicago, because she didn't hate the cold. And so she, it was between Atlanta and California. And I think she just kind of closed her eyes and just put her finger on one and it turned out to be California, thank goodness. And we got an apartment in Van Nuys, California. And my mother worked in like quality control somewhere, like, you know, data, data entry stuff. And she used to be a stay at home mom. So that, that was hard for her. It was just an adjustment. It was an adjustment for my sisters and I because my father was very strict. So we didn't have my daddy. I went crazy. I was like, boys, boys, oh my gosh. It was the valley, and that's when the valley girl talk was out. I was talking like this all the time. It's like, oh my God, I'm so in the valley. This is so great. I'm flipping my hair. I ain't even got no hair, but I'm flipping this back and forth. It was just me and my sisters and my mom when we moved here uh, to California, and it was all totally new for us. Culture shock. I was on my own. I was living on my own. My mother had put me out because it was something about if you can't live by my rules and you got to get out. I didn't know she was serious till she actually put me out. She had to grow up a lot faster, you know, and then my, when my mom died, she took the role, you know, as being the mom. She, of, you know, us, the two of us, my, my younger sister and I. My mother passed away at 41 due to diabetic complications. And my sister, my youngest sister, I believe was 16. And my other sister might have been, you know, 21 maybe. So it really forced me to be more responsible because I was all about partying. And then it's like, no, I got my teenage sister trying to get her to graduate. And I got my other sister who needs me. She was just doing the best she could. Then she had her sisters to be concerned about, uh, nephews and nieces. And she had all that on her shoulder. What I got from my mother, being a single mother, is my mother took risks. I mean, to take three children, pile all your stuff in a car, and drive cross country, and not knowing anybody, that's somebody that's just a risk taker. I really admire that in her now. I think I got that from her. Sherry is. She would have made her mother and my grandmother, and my mother proud. Sherry is just. A, person, a child that anyone would want to have as their daughter. My son, Jeffrey Charles Tarpley Jr. Oh my goodness, he's three and a half, he'll be four. And uh, he's just my miracle. Sherry has been drunk in love with her baby before he ever even existed. Um, I remember when Sherry just wanted to get pregnant and she went through so much to conceive. My husband and I did fertility. We've been trying to get pregnant for a long time and nothing was happening. Nothing was coming down a pipeline, so we did fertility. So finally it happened and they said that we were pregnant with twins. What happened was I was walking uh, our two dogs and a friend's dog and the leash got tangled around my ankle and I fell flat on my back and was bleeding profusely. We went to the fertility doctor and the embryos had come, they were not attached to my uterus. And he said, basically, Sherry, you might as well go home and put your legs up in the air because you're probably gonna have a miscarriage because they're gonna go out with the blood. And I remember crying out going, God, I've wanted this for so long. 
oh my goodness, let this let these babies be okay. Well, I was on bed rest, I ended up losing my little girl. But this little boy just kept hanging on, kept hanging on. I was on bed rest for most of my pregnancy. I prayed over this baby and he came early. He came at 25 weeks, which is about six and a half months, five and a half months. Um, he gave me 25 weeks and he weighed a pound. So he fit in my hand and my wedding ring fit over his arm. And they told us it was gonna be so many things wrong with my son. He was gonna have cerebral palsy. He probably would be mentally retarded. He would have to have shunts in his brain because of all of the blood on his brain that he would be looking at massive surgeries over his lifetime. I did not want him to know all of that pain of surgeries and you know hospitals. And I said, you know, his sister's up in heaven. His grandmother's up there, his great grandmother his uncles, he's got brothers and sisters up there. They're waiting to say mama, but they'll go Jeffrey. So I'm gonna give him to you. And I remember I was on my knees and snot's coming out of my nose. You know, you had those snot sessions with God. And I said, but Lord, but if you could give me a miracle, I would sure appreciate it, but he is yours. My ex-husband used to be Cher's pastor. And we got the call that um, they were going to uh, disconnect Jeffrey from you know, all of the tubes and everything and, and uh, let him go. So uh, we showed up to the hospital for um, my ex-husband to perform the last rites over the baby. And so we're leaning, all looking into the incubator. Jeff says to little Jeffrey, he says, hey man, say, say, say hi to your mommy. God is my witness. Everybody who was in that room will tell you that little Jeffrey was laying on one side and he turned and his hand went up like that. I'm crying and I'm sobbing and Niecy's sobbing and Jeffrey's gripping the, the ventilator tube and everybody's just sobbing. And uh, so they sat me down and they went to disconnect the tubes so they could put Jeffrey in my arm so he could take his last breath because he had had this hole in his intestine his, it was all um, like black and blue. And right before they disconnected the two, the head of the neonatal intensive care unit came in and he said, we did another ultrasound and the hole in his, in his intestine is gone. It's clear. So where it was all black and blue, it was a nice little chocolate brown on my baby's stomach. And that's when my husband and I knew, mm -mm, we, we can't pull this plug. And it was just like God was saying to me, you don't get to decide when he goes home, I decide when he comes home. And so after that, we just decided to fight for this baby. I called his team the doom and gloom <laughs> doctors. Cause you know, God bless them. They gotta give you the worst case scenarios. And they let us know, well he could have cerebral palsy. He could have mental retardation. And I'm going, whatever package God has given a, this baby to us in is the package we're gonna take. Jeffrey was in the NICU for three months. And there were so many times where his heart stopped. And so they would wake me up, beep, 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 machines going off and they pulled Jeffrey out of my arms and they go, Jeffrey, wake up. And they'd be hitting his chest and hitting his, his heart had stopped, it heart had stopped so many times. I called up my daddy, watching my baby fight for his life. And I remember saying to my father, I don't think I'm ever gonna be able to laugh again. I don't think I'm ever gonna be able to smile again. And my daddy said, time, everything's gonna work out. You, everything, you're gonna heal. You will be able to smile. And I said, Daddy, I don't think so. And I said, you promise? And he said, I promise. And, and he kept saying, you just, you keep fighting for him. But he fought, oh, my son fought. And um, I have to say, it, it, he does not have cerebral palsy. Sherry, it comes from, I pray, I believe, I walk the walk, and this is what happens as an equation. I live the, God, the, I live the life that God wants me to, to live, and he gives me miracles. That little boy walked into Barbara Walter's office a couple weeks ago, and she said, he said, hi, Barbara. And she said, hello, dear. And he said, uh, where's Whoopi? She said, Whoopi's not here. And it was right before, it was right before the inauguration. She says, dear, do you know who's going to be president? He said, mm-hmm, Obama! My son is speaking. He is, has developmental delay, so he has occupational therapy and speech therapy and physical therapy. But every time that boy runs, because they didn't think he was going to be able to walk, he runs and he goes, Mama, I love you. I just go, that's a miracle.
Jeffrey first said mommy. It was the oh. most exciting sound. But now it's like mommy, 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 mommy. It never stopped. Yeah. I go, call me Sherry, because I got me something else. He's an adorable little boy. Comes into my dressing room and says, hello, Barbara. And I think, I don't care whether she, you know, told him 15 times, say hello, Barbara, or what. Uh, it charms me. And she's like, oh, mothers, come here, sit down, don't do this, don't do that. I go, leave him alone, come in my room, Jeffrey. So is he in there? Yes, he is. What's he doing? Why do you need to know? I'm over here. So she's a mother. She just looks in his eyes with so amazement and awe, like, this is what I made, and this is wonderful. She is a wonderful, wonderful mother. I know exactly what my priority, priority is what God said. He said, you are a mother first. Everything else, I will have fall into place. Sherry has a big heart. That's why she's like your sister, your daughter, your best friend. If I need Sherry to go to the opera with me, she will go. If I need her to go slit some tires of this dude, she will go. Now she'll go with a hood and some glasses on, but she will go. That's a friend. I could go a year and not speak to Sherry, talk to Sherry. I mean, she left the law firm 12 years ago, 13 years ago. The minute you talk to Sherry, it's like no time in between of talking to Sherry. You, she doesn't forget her friends. She's the type of friend that she'll call you and make you laugh when you're down. Uh, if you're really going through, she can pray with you and really help you focus and get back to your center. I actually remember a lot of times during Less Than Perfect, either uh, she would be in my dressing room or I would go to her dressing room and I'd be crying. There was a lot of tears shed with Sherry. I remember Andy came in my dressing room and Andy said, uh, he said, Sherry, could Jesus love somebody like me? And he put his head on my chest and he started to cry. And that's when I realized you ha we, ha we can't judge people. We really can't judge people. And from then on, Andy was just, I will fight for Andy Dick. I don't care, you can't say nothing. I don't care what Andy does. He can, he can just be out there and I will fight to the death for that boy because I love him so much. She'll take my call at like two or three in the morning when I'm, when I'm not doing very well or if I'm doing very well at two or three in the morning. <laughs> you know, she's, she's, she's just a, honestly, the, she's one of my top five best friends ever in life. I cherish her. She. I mean, I literally call her my black angel. First of all, she always gonna be up. You, you understand? She like Jesus, she don't sleep. She's like the Lord, she never slumbers or sleeps. So whenever you are going through something around the clock, boom, she's gonna be like, hey girl, how you doing? Girl just sitting here just took off my wig, what's going on? You gotta love it, you got to love it. My book is called Permission Slips. It's the guide for every working woman. And it's just like, I wrote this book because after the incident with, you know, the earth is round and flat, and I just felt like, wow, people just need, women, we need permission to go. It's okay. It's okay if we make a mistake. It's okay if, you know, we don't know the answer to something. Women today in this world, we're trying to be it all. We're trying to be the working mother, we're trying to be the wife, we're trying to be, you know, uh, the friend, we're trying to be the career woman, we're trying to be the freak mama, so when the husband or boyfriend come, we hang it on the chandelier, but we gotta pick up him from soccer, and we, and it's too hard. And sometimes we just gotta give ourselves permission to just let go. And so I wrote this book that I'm hoping the women will be able to read it and laugh, and in each chapter go, okay, that's me. Sherry is young, so she hasn't begun the set a legacy, but she will have one when the, uh, this book may be the start. 
all because you're gonna find out things about her. She's got a little section in there about her dad. So when that comes out, we'll see. <laughs> The one major charity I'm involved in is March of Dimes. And that's just uh, one that's close to my heart because they're involved in the prevention of premature births. I did not know that premature births is one of the leading causes of death among, amongst infants until I went through a premature birth. And a lot of the, the life-saving techniques that were used on my son, Jeffrey, uh, were the direct cause of the research that March of Dimes had done. So when I found that out, I was like, whatever you need me to do, I, I want to help spread the word. The March of Dimes, it's, it's a wonderful uh, charity. She, you know, she um, she gathered up a group of us. We we did the walk. Um, she's given her time. She's doing it again this year. You know, she, it means a lot to her to help out the premature babies. Hi, I'm Sherry Shepard, host of The View and a March of Dimes mom. My son Jeffrey was born 15 weeks early. And without the March of Dimes, he wouldn't be here today. Another organization is anything involved, involving diabetes, because I have diabetes. And I did not realize that, again, diabetes is a big killer of black people. And a lot of things, a lot of, uh, you know, strokes and heart disease and hypertension, that's diabetes related. A lot of black people are walking around with a lot of stomach weight and, you, you know, you're almost there to diabetes. And so whatever I can do to educate people about having diabetes is, I, I try to do that. I know what it's like to grow up without a mother and to raise my sisters without a mother, and I don't want to do that to my child. She has no hesitation in giving. If something touches her, she'll give. She takes the time to, to give back. She doesn't forget where, she, where she's been. I think it's important for celebrities to give back to charity because, you know, you can, you can use this celebrity for good, or you can use it for just nothing. And it's really easy. So I think that it's really important that celebrities do that. And, but it's very fulfilling. It really, really is to know that you are trying to help somebody. I just always thought if I could just help somebody, if, it, if you can look at my life and, and go, wow, Sherry's made me laugh and she's made me feel a little bit better about the situation that I'm in and um, then I feel like, okay, I think I've done what God is asking me to do. Well, I think that she's a role model in the sense that she's um, uh, candid. Uh, ca uh, she's, she's, she speaks her mind. You know how hard it is to make it, just to make it on anything, and Sherry is still climbing, and she's get, she doesn't give up. You know, she could have stopped a long time ago, and that's why she's a role model. She's going to be one of those people who you look back and go, she did all that? She was the first one to do that? She was the shortest one to do that? I think that, that, the, that it is still unfolding. I think what's helped Sherry to get where she's at right now is her approachability. She's a pioneer in the area of just showing the average person have your faith, believe in your faith, whatever that may be, and just believe in you as a person, and you, you, you can make it. She never said, I'm down at the bottom. She never, she always looked up to the stars. And you know, and like I said, she's on her way. My son is my greatest accomplishment. My son, um, going from not being able to say but two words, and people not expecting much from him, running down the hallway having a conversation with Barbara Walters. She's the girl who made it. You know, she was the secretary who became a standout, you know, and had the, the help of her friends with her and the support system with her. She loves being a stand-up comedian and she loves being in the sitcoms and she loves doing dramatic roles. So what I hope for her is she has it all. I have strong faith that Sherry is gonna be A-OK -okay and even go beyond expectation. Sometimes I feel like it, it's a balloon and somebody's gonna pop it and I'm gonna wake up and go, whew, I had a dream that I was an actress on a talk show and had movies. And then the lawyer's gonna go, did you get my coffee? Get my coffee. And I'm just gonna go like, wow. I just, it was so real. <laughs> so much is happening with Sherry. She is about to have uh, her own series uh, based in part on her life as, as a divorced mother. Um, and because she's so uh, 
funny and exuberant and smart. Sherry's very smart. I think it will be a big success. You don't forget Sherry. People want to see her do good, and she's just a breath of fresh air. I think it you, it absolutely makes sense that Sherry Shepard will be considered a real life diva. You don't come to LA with nothing, have your car repossessed, your husband go crazy, and get up and sit down on The View every single day, and people don't know what diva. Get into it, yes. Sherry's story, number one, is so, it comes from a place of such truth and vulnerability and also the ability to truly laugh off difficult situations. I mean, this is not a woman who is breezing through life. You know, she has had hardship, she's had struggle, and um, but she kind of just like paddles through with a big laugh stick and if that's how she does it, I think we all could learn from that. Adiva is a woman who, she may not feel confident every day, but every day she gets up and she says, I'm gonna do this because I have a lot of people depending on me to get it done. So I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna put one foot in front of the other, I'm gonna wipe those tears away, and it's a new day. And I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna smile, and I'm gonna work hard, I'm gonna make a difference in this world. That's what a diva is to me. And a diva is a person who just goes, this is me. If you don't accept it, it's okay, it's still me. I was standing in front of the mirror trying to get my heckler lines together because I had big boobs. So that was the first thing somebody would say. I'd get on stage and I would always hear from somewhere in the room, damn, look at them big look, you know, and I, so I was in the mirror and I came up with, uh, with a great line. You know, you couldn't afford all of these boobs. You'd have to put them on layaway to get any part of my boobs. And it, it sounded good in the mirror. When I said it, then I went to the...